Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend and give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms. Also, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe even a review for us. It might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. Now, you can support the Virtual Memory Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I had a, a funky sort of epiphany a few days ago. We'll see if it sticks. Um, this was Friday morning, and I had a conference call with the trade associations for a couple of other adjacent industries to the one that I run a trade association in. Uh, my sector had the least involvement in the topic under discussion, but I wanted to be on the call so I could just keep up with the subject when we have to talk to the feds about it, or even when we're talking internally, even if it turns out that my members do have some interest in this topic, I would know what was talked about. So um, the complication was that was a 9 a.m. call, and I had to get my car inspected that day. So I got out to the motor vehicles inspection place at 8 a.m. Um, and rather than go home and then have to do the call, I hit a diner for breakfast, uh, prepped to reading the the uh, original draft material for this call. Um, then I drove over to the nearby Barnes and Noble and called in and listened in from there on my AirPods. Um, the Barnes and Noble has a used book section in back, which is pretty awesome. So I headed there, called, uh, introduced myself, muted the line so they wouldn't hear the background music over it, and uh, and just listened in. And and from there, I just. You know, I, I listened to the call, but I also just walked around the store and looked at books for like 45 minutes or so before um, picking up the paperback of a book by an upcoming guest who I have a hard cover of and I'd rather read it in paperback because it'll be more portable. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, then I drove home for the rest of the call, but but it was just relaxing. Um, I hadn't just meandered like that in a long time. I'm always going somewhere, doing something, feeling like I'm giving short shrift to work or the podcast or this or that or the other. And I've been, I've been so busy lately and had anxiety over a lot of stuff that I've, I've just started to lose track of a lot of things. Like, I feel like I'm constantly chasing, which I know you guys all feel, but in my case, it's, it's new business and new podcast guests, new legislation, trying to get people to listen to, to past episodes and networking and in every context. And also I've been thrown off of my running schedule pretty much from mid January on because of illness and some knee issues. And, and that's kind of screwed with my psyche too. Um, it all kind of came to a head the day before that conference call. See, I was reading an upcoming guest memoir, and a couple of uh, bits in the memoir reminded me of some other books that I'd read recently, and I couldn't figure out which ones, and it's not like there's that many, and I had to go into my list of books spreadsheet to figure out which ones and uh, which authors I'd been reminded of, and some of these things were only from a few weeks ago, so if anything tells me I've been pushing too hard and... Um, and going through the motions or something, it's that. So so what happened in the bookstore was that I slowed things down. 
I I did not have anxiety or guilt over you know giving work short shrift because I was paying attention to work but I was also among books and among a whole bunch of books by past guests and and kind of able to synthesize all that stuff in a way that just put me at ease um I could keep walking around and and writing down notes about books and items from the conference call that were pertinent and just just letting the moments stretch on and the call went fine um Although, I will say, at the end, when I was driving home, uh, they wrote me into writing the summary report of the call. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think it was mean-spirited or that they, they felt I was slacking. It was more the, I'm the one guy who was a former magazine editor in this whole group of, of people on the call. I've got some objectivity since my sector is the one farthest removed from the topic. Um and there was an existing draft. It was just a matter of incorporating what we went into on the, what they went into on the call into, um, into language that I could finesse in a way that I know who we're trying to reach with this stuff. And I know the sorts of tricks they do rhetorically. And well, anyway, that's going into way too much detail. The upshot is I've spent the weekend kind of cultivating that sense of, of openness to time of, of slowing things down. Um, and I'm hoping it'll carry into the week ahead, although I will be at another conference in New York City Tuesday through Thursday, and I've already scheduled a podcast for Wednesday with a board meeting on Tuesday, and then uh, basically back and forth logistics nightmare on Thursday so I can get my things back to Jersey, but get back to New York in time for a gallery opening for another upcoming guest. And those are all the things that I use to keep myself from just stepping back and looking at things. I give myself a lot of um, activities to coordinate, a lot of logistics, a lot of things that I know I can achieve, but that will take busy time. And that's um, that's not good, but that's who I am. So I'm, I'm going to try to fix that. And I'm hoping this this weird episode with the conference call actually helps with that. That said, I haven't written up the report yet, and I need to take care of that um, probably Sunday evening. Anyway, during my last multi-day conference in New York, when I was really just cramming in meetings and barely giving myself time to think, I recorded this week's show. Um, my guest this time around is Mark Allen Stamity, the legendary cartoonist behind Washingtons in the, the Washington Post and the Village Voice weekly serial MacDoodle Street. Now, New York Review Comics is publishing a 40th anniversary hardcover edition of McDoodle Street uh, out this week. And it, it comes along with a, a new 20-page comic from Mark about what happened to McDoodle Street and who he became over over the previous or the, the subsequent 40 years. Um, it's an amazing book. I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. McDoodle Street ran just a little bit before my time. It was like 77 to, or 78, 79. I would have been seven, eight years old. I discovered the Village Voice still far too young, just a few years later when I was like 12 or so. Um, and they had the dirty classified ads in back, which, of course, you know, my draw. Um, but it was at my local library in northern New Jersey. And over time, I came to, to see Ben Catcher and Linda Barry, uh, Matt Groening, their, their syndicated strips that were in it. And of course, Jules Pfeiffer, who was the legend for alt weeklies. Uh, but I'm just a little bit late to, to have read Mark's work when it was actually coming out. That said, McDoodle Street is an amazing, important work. And a few weeks ago on the show, uh, James Sturm talked about how discovering McDoodle Street helped him make the jump from superhero comics to to the bigger world. And now that I've read this collection, I get exactly how that happened. Um, ostensibly, MacDoodle Street is sort of the story of a poet named Malcolm Frizzle, who writes poetry for Dishwasher Monthly. Um, but it, it veers all over the place. You could tell from the outset that it's got an absurdist bent. Um, there is an ongoing plot about uh, irate conservative Wayne Newton fans trying to occupy a West Village cafe. There is also a ton of metafictional uh, element that just takes the reader along on this this crazy dizzying ride. Um, Mark had already made a name for himself with with these overstuffed panoramic depictions of life in New York in, in the Village Voice, and this strip has a ton of that embedded into it. There are scenes on the the sidewalk and the subway that are are. They're just beautiful, but impossible to, to, you know, imagine actually drawing and putting together. Um, the strip also features a, a cast of characters that 
could only come out of, of the, the weird urban life of 70s New York. Um, like I say, it's absurdist, but MacDoodle Street also has moments of, of genuine heart and, and real affection and gets into what art really means to us and what we're trying to achieve through it. I'm sort of amazed at, at Mark's accomplishment of that in an era that really hadn't figured out what a graphic novel is and didn't quite have a a way of understanding that a weekly serial strip could do something like this. He was a real trailblazer in that respect. Uh, that he was able to make the strip on a weekly basis is pretty astonishing. That said, there are weeks when the strip itself admits that it is taking some time off from the main beat and just doing its own thing. Anyone who has produced any sort of regular column or comic or or serialized story or whatever knows exactly what that feeling is like. And Mark had some interesting ways of, of getting past that, that dreaded deadline doom. Now, all of this said, I'm doing absolutely no justice to the cartooning itself, which when you see it, you'll say, oh, that guy. It's obviously Mark Allen Stamity. Um, it's got this, this weird and wonderful glyphic 2D quality and, and this amazing sense of, of composition. You'll see all of that in just one glance at his work, much less the cover of MacDoodle Street, which is one of those those massive compositions of a uh, uh, subway scene in this case. Oh, my God. It, it's beautiful, beautiful work. I'm just looking at the cover now. Anyway, with MacDoodle Street in this new hardcover from New York Review Comics, Mark came up to my hotel where I was staying for this conference so we could talk about the strip and what it meant to him then and, and what it means 40 years later. Now, there are a million things we did not cover, like Washington's, um, his experiences in D.C., some of his later work. And after we finished up, um, I will say Mark really let me have it over not working on my own writing. And I've sort of taken that to heart. Um, we'll see how that all pans out as I've learned to stretch time and space. But you get the good stuff in this episode. Oh, uh, also, if you're listening to this in the week that it comes out, that's the first week of April 2019, for you time travelers out there, Mark will be appearing at the Mocha Arts Festival in New York City to support the book on April 6th and 7th. Uh, a bunch of other past pod guests will also be there. Um, I, I wrote down all of them here. Mort Gerberg, Joe Chardello, Lauren Weinstein, Keith Knight, Liza Donnelly, Karen Green, Andrea Tsurumi, Bob Eckstein, James Sturm, Glennis Fox, Summer Pierre, Jennifer Hayden, Peter Cooper, and show organizer Bill Cardalopoulos. Um, you can find out more by checking out societyillustrators.org and checking the events tab for the Mocha Arts Festival, which is run by the Society of Illustrators. Uh, now, caveats. As mentioned, we recorded in my hotel room in Midtown. Um, I had to filter out the air conditioning fan, which makes our voices slightly weird, but that's okay. And because it's Midtown, there's the occasional police siren, but no other real noise. Now, here's Mark's bio. Mark Allen Stamity is an acclaimed cartoonist and illustrator. His children's books include Who Needs Donuts, Aaliyah's Mission, Shake, Rattle, and Turn That Noise Down, Small in the Saddle, Mini Maloney and Macaroni, and Where's My Hippopotamus? In 1977 and 78, Mark's panoramic centerfold cartoons for The Village Voice of Greenwich Village and Times Square attracted widespread attention and were sold by The Voice as posters. He then created a series of comic strips for that paper, including MacDoodle Street. In 1981, he created the acclaimed political comic strip Washington for The Voice and The Washington Post, and it was soon picked up by more than 40 papers. From 1994 to 1996, he was the political cartoonist for Time magazine, and from 2001 to 2003, he produced the monthly comic strip Books, B-O-O-X, for the New York Times Book Review. His cartoons, illustrations, covers, and comics reporting have appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, New York, GQ, and many other magazines and newspapers. His honors include two gold medals and two silver medals from the Society of Illustrators, the Premio Satira Politica Forte del Marmi, 2005, from the Museum of Satire and Caricature in Forte del Marmi, Italy, a Page One Award from the Newspaper Guild of New York, and the Augustus St. Gaudens Alumni Career Award from Cooper Union. He was born in Brooklyn in 1947 and lives in New York. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Mark Allen Stamity.
Can you talk a little about revisiting MacDoodle Street for its 40th, 40th, 41st, 40th, 40th, <laughs> 40th anniversary? Um, what was it like looking back on this this work at this point? And how often have you done that over the, the years? Um, well, here, you know, now and then, the, the, the thing for me about MacDoodle Street is it, it was, I, for many years, I felt like it was the closest I ever got to a direction I wanted to go, which was kind of writing graphic novels, illustrated novels. I, you know, I, I, I wanted to write novels, you know, with drawings, words, and pictures. And, um, and so, and, and I, and I liked, uh, you know, absurd things. Uh, so I wanted to write a kind of crazy, nutty kind of novels. And, um, so, um, so I and 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 I at that time I did the best I could do at doing that and and then in the years since I've kind of while I've while I've had um, you know um, other things that I've done like you know um, like I did political strips for sure. many years and other things um, I you know that I, I felt like that was that was the closest I'd gotten but I wanted to go beyond it you know so um but but um i love it um i have to say and 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 i and 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 it i i forget i've forgotten a lot of things i've done so it's fun to you know see them again i've you know through the years um i've forgotten things i've done i know i once saw a film documentary about jules pfeiffer and, and there was a and somebody he was in he was in Martha's Vineyard and somebody was saying some women were fans and they were saying to him, Oh, do you remember the one about this? You know, and he said, Oh, I remember every one of them. And I thought, <laughs> Boy, I don't. I forgot <laughs> I forgot a lot of stuff. And so so anyway, so it's fun to it's fun to remember it also. And there was a just a I love what I was aiming at with it, and I think I basically got where I was trying to get to. So, um, so, I, and I'm happy. And I'm happy that it's in a hard cover now because it was in a floppy soft cover, yeah. you know, back when, and a, and a pretty cheap binding. And also, they uh, they asked me um, at New York uh, Review Comics. There's these two. Um, uh, editors that, that I work with, Gabe and Lucas, and they're really great. Everybody there is really great. And they and they love paper and they love ink on paper and they, you know and they asked me to do um an addendum that would uh, you know something at the end they wanted me to tell like what happened to McDoodle Street at the end because McDoodle Street kind of drifted off at the end. It said it was coming back. back. Yeah, and never came back. Mm -hmm. And um and I was really happy to to do that so that's you know in the so in the you know in the end there's the um there's the the addendum and um and well if you know having if you i, I if you read it. yeah reading yeah. having read the addendum you know you know that um it's um it, it was a real sort of little odyssey for me um it was it was um i i, I had gotten to a point with mcdoodle street where i i really um couldn't keep doing it. It was because because I, I like if I was going to write a novel, uh, I didn't want to have that time frame of week to week. You commit yourself to to, to uh, this is what it is, and it can't change. Right. You know, and you can't go back and you know and and uh, so, we, so mar we marvel over Charles Dickens that much. More yeah, exactly. Oh, and a lot of yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think there are. I think there. Are, well, there's certainly other. Um, there are cartoonists like that too, you know, the old comic strip guys. I guess you know, probably Milton Kniff or whoever. But although they didn't write novels at novel length, but yeah, Dickens. Okay, you know, I don't know how he did it. Everybody has a different kind of brain. Uh, I was so so. I was glad to sum up in the end um, how. Uh, Either how McDoodle yeah, Street ended or, or how you ended. I was, well, where, where I went from do. there, where yeah. I went from there, yeah, where I mean, it just just that uh, I had to continue doing that. I, I had to, I wanted to continue being a cartoonist, being an artist. So it was, it was, you know, I, and I gave my all to McDoodle Street, and then I reached a point where I just couldn't, I couldn't go on indefinitely working that way, and and. Um, 
you know, I ended up when I when I the strip I did after that was very experimental, but it was week to week. Every week it was very different, and I didn't write it to deadline. That was a different thing. And then I and then I got a call from the Washington Post editorial page editor in um, in 1981, and she wanted me to do a McDoodle Street version of Washington, mm-hmm. and and that was um, you know that was a whole other kind of uh, uh, pressure and everything. But eventually that got down to. Every week, it was whatever it was. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't dealing with a long plot and stuff. I had some yeah. continuing characters, and and um, but they were there to serve yeah. that week story as yeah. opposed to yeah. So it's interesting to see. Um, I mean, you know, I love McDougal Street for for what it is. At the same time, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm I'm I hope I've. Uh, found more of the the um the chops i think i've found more of the chops to do more to yeah. go farther with what with with uh novels with fiction yeah are there aspects of it graphically i'm not going to ask if you were ever tempted to go back and fix anything but uh, things you look at and think man i cannot believe i drew that back then uh, or does it feel like early stage for you given the the progress or the progression your work made over the years um well my eyes have changed <laughs> i always you know i drew to size I, yeah. I drew i drew my you know i drew my book who needs donuts to size i drew my early you know children's books to size and i drew mcdoodle street to size and my eyes are different now <laughs> so i don't work that that tiny um uh so i mean in that way i guess but um i i know you know i know the um you know, I, I know the headspace I was coming from, and and I um, and I, you know, recall what it was. Yeah, do you recognize yourself? Uh, yeah, in, in definitely. Those, yeah. yeah, I mean, I I, I um, and I know, and I know also the limits of 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 you know, I know the I know um, well, there was, you know, I had I had certain restraints of what of. of I mean, I had to do it within a week, and I and I and and um, I had a certain amount of space, and um, and and uh, and I had a and I had the understanding that I had about story and characters, etc. So you know, for since then, I've tried to expand my understanding of all of that. So I, you know, I I think it holds up for, I think I think it holds up. And I and I, I you know I mean I love th- I wanted to play with the with the form of a comic strip yeah so well, so of, where you know Malcolm shakes you can yeah. shake Malcolm's hand and and and, uh, <laughs> and you can the kiss other, the, and you, the yeah the you can kiss yeah. the comic strip <laughs> and and you know I just wanted to I wanted to play with the form of a comic strip in in kind of every way that I could and and um, and uh, like. And so I enjoy I, en- I enjoyed coming at it, you know, in that w- with that whole way. Like how, ca- you know, like how can I not get in a rut, and how can I? And I wanted it to wander, and I wanted it to be, you know, kind of like uh, I wanted it to kind of go off in left field and get lost, and, and then and then, you know, kind find the, find the and, plot again. Yeah. yeah, and and but I I mean I, uh, you know, wandering was a was a part of it. I I you know I. A big part when I in my teen years and when I came to New York to go to art school, Cooper Union, I, um, I, I, uh, like a, a lot. I, I did a lot of long walks at night, like in the wee hours, a lot of times, um, all around the city and stuff, and and just absorbing things and um, and kind of, you know, there's a, like. Um, Absorbing things and being guided by what I felt, and um, you know, Malcolm Frazzle's um, f- uh, favorite philosopher is this uh, guy named Thomas Onion, who believes in dawdling and uh, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, kind of just uh, spacing out and and, uh, and allowing something to happen so so i wanted the i wanted the strip to have that kind of a feel you know like malcolm is kind of uh embodied well, he's kind of drifting off somewhere but he kind of finds his way and mm-hmm. and uh destiny is stronger than he is and, and 
Do you feel it's a, I don't want to say time capsule, but that it captures that, that era? Well, it is. Well, it, I mean, um, it's late seventies. I lived York. on McDougal street for yeah. 22 years. I moved in, in 1968. I came to the city in 65 and, and then, um, I, w- I moved to, into McDougal, McDougal street, 1968. And I was there till 1990. And, um, you know, it was a, it was a wonderful world that I was in. You know, and um, and and it and uh, my I'd say that my um, let's see my hope my vision is always wider than my grasp. You know, so <laughs> so I, I would say that I did my best to capture something of it, but it was vast. You know, so it was so. Um, so I, so I, you know, um, but you there capture was, that too. Yeah, I mean, there was the a lot more. I mean, is, I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> one of your your panoramic ten million people. Yeah, all the yeah. And did, have you seen the posters I did like of Greenwich Village? Yeah, time? yeah. So it was like so that was, you know, another another reach at that. But it was, but you know, it was all vast. You know, um, it was. Um, I mean, there was so much that that happened. Randomly, you know, I'm just, I was thinking like, you know, one night I just, I mean, this just pops into my head, but I mean, it was just one night I, I just, I, cause I'd walk around at night a lot. And one night I wandered over to Sheridan Square and everybody was running all over the place in every direction. And it was just complete chaos. And that turned out to be the night of, um, uh, you know, when the gay, the gay oh, the Stonewall, uh, Stonewall, that yeah. was the night of Stonewall, you know, and boom and everything. Yeah, the, the second when, guest this year who was physically around it when it yeah, happened. That's, I, that's I was. something. And, and, and then another thing was uh, one night I was uh, walking by Folk City, which was on Third Street at that time between McDougal and and Sixth Avenue. And it was one o'clock in the morning, and normally they were closed at that time. But at the, but but for some reason there was this bright light coming shining out of Folk City at one a.m. and I and I didn't know uh, um, why. And um, uh, so I walk in. There's people. There's people hanging around, and I, I walk in and I look over at the bar, and there's Phil Oaks, and standing next to him and talking. She, he's talking to Joan Baez. And then I and then I look in the in the back room. There's a front room and a back room. There's Patty Smith, there's Eric Anderson, and then on the stage is Allen Ginsberg. And uh, there's this whole event anyway. And 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 um, anyway, it was this whole. And in the back was Bob Dylan with a camera. He was filming this thing because it was the 60th birthday of this guy Mark Mike Porco, who had um, was the owner of Folk City. They were celebrating. This was, I think, 1973, and uh, three or four, or something, three, I think it was. Anyway, you can kind of Google this this night, and and uh, um, and then I was standing between the two rooms, and right next to me, seated, was Bette Midler, who was she was a she was. Well, anyway, she yeah. she'd had a little bit to smoke, I think, and um, and and Eric Clapton, who was had had a lot to drink, was up on the stage at one point, and. Um, and all the, anyway, it was this whole crazy thing. Like, I just wandered into it, you know. And I wandered into a lot of things, you know. In those, <laughs> in those. Uh, so I it was way more than I probably could ever capture. But I, but I, I, at least that's where the strip came from. That whole love of the chaos of the city, the the love of the village, love of just the. You know, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, and my father, my parents were both gag cartoonists. And uh, my father would go into the city, you know, single panel gag cartoonists, would go in the city once a week. And once in a while, he would bring me to go around to the magazines. And, uh, but he, and he'd, he'd come back and talk about 43rd Street and 54th Street and all this stuff. And I just, I was just, it excited me. I don't know. And I, the, the energy of the city excited me. I wanted to get to the city. And and I and you know all those walks at night and whatever it was like I wanted to just take in the energy of the city and eventually allow it to come through in my work you know because because it was just there's just you know the, the with just so many different things happening all the time I just love that. Mm-hmm. How's your New York changed? Yeah, it changes and stays the same, but it's very sad ways that it's changed. I mean. You know the the worst part is the rents. You know it's like the real estate is completely sick. I mean it's just. I mean, you know, and I I never had I never had a great um, 
a genius for real estate, unfortunately. But, you know, back then, there were these, like, rent-controlled apartments. I mean, I had a rent-controlled apartment. I had I had two railroad flats next to each other eventually. But, uh, but there were these gigantic apartments on the Upper West Side, you know, like the 70s, 70s and off-Broadway yeah. and stuff. And and they were like, you know, seven, eight, ten room apartments with a view of the river and they were like, you know, rent controlled and it was, yeah. it was like and I was I was too little of a visionary to well, understand what was gonna you happen. You know, if you were that sort of visionary, chances are you wouldn't have been that much of a cartoonist if you were <laughs> maybe spending so, your time you thinking know, about real maybe estate. Maybe so. So that was so yeah. but basically, yeah, it's I mean, so many there's just places um, that I really miss and, and the, a lot of things I miss. And in another way, there's a similar kind of a feel, you know, like Washington Square Park still has that s similar feel, even McDougal Street, even, you know, like the, I don't know where, you know, all these young people are probably all living on top of each other, but they, uh, they still come into the village, you know, and, and, uh, I, you know, NYU, um, little by little he ate up lots, yeah. tons of the neighborhood, but and I never understood that these kids that went to NYU, they were paying a lot. I went to Cooper Union. We didn't have a yeah, tuition. That's all covered. That, yeah. yeah, we yeah. didn't have tuition then, you know. And and I hope we hope for the future they won't. But um, but I didn't realize, you know, that now I'm I'm you know I'm I'm in the village again, and um, and and I see all these kids from NYU, and I realize. Uh, somebody's got to have some money, yeah. you know, and that's the sad part of the thing. It's just, it's like, it's just, that's the sad, it's really, the, it's the money thing that has, is the sad part. And otherwise, I mean, I still love the city, I, you know, but. But we're we're here. They they just opened Hudson Yards this uh, yeah. This I've past been hearing week, that name, and so. I don't know what it is really. What well, is it? For, is it well, a, is it in where is it? It is just south of the Javits Center. Over yeah, the yeah, that's yards. where I thought it was. And they were and, the, and there a, were a bunch of railroad tracks. Yeah, over they're there, covering so you, that with. You know, the they deck. talked about that for a long well, time. Well, they were going to put the Jets Stadium there uh, yeah. under Bloomberg, and that got blown up by Shelley Silver, who's now convicted. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we have our super rich enclave. In in the far west side now, so well the tr yeah. the tragedy about stadiums for me. I mean now yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna well I guess it's no secret how old I am, but uh, <laughs> but the thing is if anybody bothers to do the math, you don't have to do the math. Uh, but, I did when, when yeah. I was first looking. <laughs> but anyway, at yeah. no, but I mean I I I was born in Brooklyn. At the age of three, we moved to the Jersey Shore. I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. I was born in Brooklyn. The year Jackie Robinson started, you know, so I, oh, yeah. I feel like uh, and and um, so so I love the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I, and as I was becoming a more and more intense fan in 1958, they broke my heart and left. And 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 the thing was where that BAM thing or what that that where that the Nets basketball yeah. thing is all that. That, Barclay Center. that was yeah. supposed to be. O'Malley, even evil O'Malley wanted that to be the Dodgers stadium. And, and, and uh, what's his name? Moses, Robert Moses, Robert Moses yeah. blocked it. Otherwise, that's what. So, so when you talk about stadiums, that's the big tragedy of my life. That stadium, I would have had a completely different life if they'd built, if the Dodgers had, <laughs> had a stadium, yeah. it, you know, where that, where that basketball thing is. I mean, um, Atlantic and Pacific. I think it's right by yeah, Atlantic. Yeah, it's on the Atlantic Yards. That's what I they mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's so that so when you when you talk about the stadium that might have been or could be or is or was, I hey. I got one thing I think about. <laughs> you could have gone a different you know, career. I, I have, peanut I have, vendor. You know? What? Yeah. You could have gone a different <laughs> career, a slung peanuts. Yeah, or exactly. Yeah. No, but I would have spent a lot of time. I would have all these crazy Met fans and all these crazy Yankee fans. I, you know, I would have had a team and I would have known a lot of batting averages that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you cheer for the Dodgers against I, the Yankees I still, back in the I 70s? Still, I still cheer for the Dodgers, okay. sort of distantly, but um, I, 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 hung in, I hung in at least uh, into the early 70s about that. But it, it's, you know, anyway, it was a terrible thing. <laughs> now, let me ask you, you said at the beginning that, you know, you'd wanted to make... A graphic novel, even though that that term didn't exist. Back yeah, in the I called Street it a days. comic strip novel at the time, but I wanted to basically work with words and pictures. But were there there models 
Were there um, were there things you were looking at saying I want to do what he's doing? Well, uh, or was it one of those you sort of had to? You, did you feel yeah. like you were building a new form? At the um, time? You know, I I think I maybe was. I don't think I was very. I was not aware of. Um, um, Eisner, what's his first name? Yeah, Will Eisner. Will Eisner. I was not really aware of Will Eisner. I was aware of Mad Magazine, and, and, and the Mad Magazine seemed to kind of ape his style looking back. I mean, some there was some work in there that was yeah. that was similar to... Uh, but I, I wasn't... I didn't know about Will Eisner at, back then. I knew about... Um, I knew about Pfeiffer. Jules Pfeiffer was yeah. a huge influence on me. And, and um, I knew about Ronald Searle, George Gross... Um, Steinberg, you know, and I knew, and I grew up looking at gag cartoonists, and I look up, grew up reading Little Abner, and you know, and uh, Little Lulu, and all these, you know, there were a lot of things I loved, and Dennis the Menace, and I actually knew Dennis the Menace because my my parents were, my father was a freelance cartoonist with Hank Ketchum before there was a Dennis, and my parents were friends, you know, we oh, were all wow. friends, and actually we visited, we visited them, and they visited, they were in Connecticut, we visited them, they visited us. So I knew the actual Dennis uh, the, when we were little boys, but anyway, th so um, so I had a lot of influences, and my parents were influences on me. Um, but uh, and then and then when I went to Cooper, a lot of things I took in, um, and I looked at a lot of fine art and I et cetera. But the, in terms of writing, I was always a slow reader, and that was always that's always been a problem. It was especially a problem when I was a political cartoonist. I was a slow reader from first grade on, mm -hmm. and and uh, so that's been a, a real handicap for me. And I've done everything I can to compensate for that. So so I wish I had read a lot more books than I was able to read. But I would say that I um, I started out doing picture books. I always I, I was trying to write a novel when I was in high school and I made these, you know, terrible efforts at Been it. There. It was awful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was awful. But anyway, but then but then um uh then I got into kids' books when I get, went to Cooper Union. I, I my friend Frank Ash was doing kids books and, and he one day he saw my portfolio and he 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 got me uh, he had a, a story. He he was already getting published when we were in school and then I, I uh Illustrated a book for him, Yellow Yellow, that's actually being reprinted in the summer. But um, oh. and so Yellow Yellow came out. This was a book I illustrated that Frank had written. This was before Who Needs Donuts, and I got a fan letter from this this young woman out in in Florida. She worked in a bookstore. I'm trying to remember her name now, but anyway, Joan, Joan Vigliotta, and she sent me, and she started sending me. She loved Yellow Yellow. And she sent me a birthday present. She started sending me a birthday present every year. Mm -hmm. And sometime in the mid mid seventies, she sent me a, 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 another roadside attraction. Uh, Tom Robbins. By Tom Robbins. Okay. And and I read that book, and um, I I felt like this is the kind of thing you know like this the, the, the what i what i loved about that novel when i read it at the time i mean i don't know i haven't read it since but um it was just kind of insane and yeah. and 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 i'd say that that i you know that i reading that novel i felt like yeah this is the kind of thing i want to write like some just insane you know it just i don't know yeah. I, it just felt like this is my sort of my genre or something and uh but I was going to do it with pictures so um so that was a key thing um when I was in high school I read Candy which was sort of a uh, Terry crazy, Southern yeah, yeah Terry Southern which was sort of this crazy novel but I wanted to write and also that one one time you know when I was a junior in high school when I was a in fourth grade um our teacher Mrs. Faber we had her for fourth and fifth grade because she liked us so much. But she, but in the early in fourth grade, she said, "I want you to write a story about Halloween." And as soon as she said that, I got excited and I just felt like I'm all over this one, you know. And I and I and I wrote this story easily. Had a lot of fun doing it. And then we all read our stories to the class. And when I read mine to the class, a bunch of kids wanted copies of it. So my mother, with like <laughs> carbon paper, typed yeah. out copies of it. And and um, and then I was the favorite story guy in our, and we were three times a year she had us do stories and everybody would wait for my story. So I got, then I got the notion I can write and I liked writing, you know, 
And then, and then, and then through the rest of public school, I mostly would beg teachers to have creative writing and they just would not do it. And, but I was always a good writer anyway. And then junior year in high school, um, we had, there was one, I, you know, like I said, I was a slow reader, so we would have to, you know, so we had some reading assignment overnight. And, uh, so the teacher assigned this thing and then uh, the next day she popped the essay thing on us. She said, you know, so she gave us an essay question about this story we were supposed yeah. to read, which I had not read. So I just made stuff up and I made up this crazy <laughs> story about, you know, she said something about what did this guy do with his wife, something or other. I don't know. And I, it's, I, somebody just said he left her and he went to Arizona and he met Yogi Berra and he, you know, I just went on and I made this, wrote this crazy thing. And, um, and when, when she got, when, when she was returning the papers, she, she, she gave me, we, instead of F's, we had E's. She gave me an A over an E. It was E, you know, F because I didn't read the story, but an A because of what I wrote. And she read it to the class and everyone laughed. And that was this kind of like crazy thing, you know, that I wanted to. So that that was so that when I did when that happened, I thought, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And there it was, you know, like she I had this assign, you know, I mean, I had this I had this moment where I and I just made this up. And it, and it, at that point, it came really easily, this just insane story. And that was so those were the kind of things I had in mind, um, you know, as I was approaching McDoodle Street. You know. yeah, had you ever been tempted to go into the family business? Uh, and, and do which gag, was cartooning. Gag, gag cartooning. Yeah, yeah. Which is very different um, than, than. No, I wasn't. I could send you a thing from the New Yorker that I did. I did a two page spread about. Um, oh, yeah. I remember a, you did, did that. Uh, yeah. Uh, 10 years ago or I so. Could, yeah, yeah. And it, well, the thing is, there's. I mentioned that I didn't have the gene for gag cartooning. I tried mm -hmm. to do it when I was a teenager a little bit. I mean, I, I made these sort of terrible things. But. but um, it was really when I saw Pfeiffer, a six 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 Jules Pfeiffer, yeah. and he was doing these narratives, and he was really, he was really breaking new ground. You know, it was like he just was, he was making his own rules, really, and um, and the guy would just look at you and start talking, or people would just talk, and and um, and the, with the lines, you know, they were so expressive, and it was so, you know, it was just, it was just like that. That just made me, you know, it's like I knew. I want to do, you know, narratives. And um, so, um, yeah, so that, and, and actually I kind of resisted the family business when I was a kid, which with a, with an impossible dream, <laughs> which is, which is really a cliche of an era. Probably Second base for the Dodgers? Well, center field. Center field, really okay. Yeah. Left field, probably more realistically left field. But uh, yeah, I wanted to play outfield for the Dodgers. Yeah. I wanted to play 20 years. I wanted to never bat below 300. You know, I wanted to <laughs> yeah. never listen, hit less than, you know, 30 or 40 home runs. You know, I had my, I wanted to have my, you know, I'd look at baseball cards. Like there were certain cards. There was a guy, well, like for pitchers, there was a guy, Warren Spahn. I don't know if you, yeah. you know these guys. Yeah, yeah. For instance, well, you look at, he had like a 20 year career that was just astonishing, you know, and there's, a, there's, a, uh, there were, other, there are others like that. I'm trying to think of who the well, other, there's always though, the Hank there, Aaron. Well, then, yeah, well, well, the, the Hank Aaron, Aaron yeah, and Hank Aaron was part that home run yeah. number just keeps going and going. And uh, yeah, Hank Aaron was, 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 I, Hank, uh, I mean, he was, was 70, so, yeah. Hank Aaron started, um, in my years, you know, I mean, yeah. in my, when I was a kid, he was with the, yeah. the we, I knew him on the Milwaukee Braves. But um, but yeah, there was Hank. But you know, for me, well, Duke Snyder was my hero, and then there was, <laughs> but there were, you know, like Ted Williams. You know, look at his baseball card, except for the easy years in the war. But you know, there were. I just had this this anyway. So, <laughs> so I I, uh, yeah. I beat my head against the wall about that for a while, but then I realized I I was going to pick up a pencil. <laughs> yes. And draw the Duke Snyder card. Yeah, and, yeah, and exactly. <laughs> Were there other, you know, graphic novel type projects you wanted to? Well, I'm working on two to. now that yeah. are that are, and I and I, you know, for for I have a whole lot of chapter ones and chapter one, two, threes, and yeah. I have, I have years from you know, especially well from the late seventies then and. 
and then more intensely in the 1980s. And for years, I have beginnings of things yeah. where because I'd have these like weekly deadlines and stuff. And they were and they'd be writing deadlines. So it's like I didn't it was really hard to just fully, fully just sit down and write a novel, yeah. you know, write a big, long thing. So and um, so and a lot of things, you know, I'd write I'd just sort of I'd write in these spurts of things and and um, and, uh, you know, of the varying qualities. And some would be with um, just words and some would be with pictures and also. I've kept voluminous diaries since I was 18, so I have close to 230 or 240 volumes of these diaries, and I write and draw in them, and they're, you know, sort of a, just, tr just, just trying to put down on paper, what, I mean, it's like therapy and stuff, but it's like, a, it, you know, just trying to do in the moment what I'd like to do in a lot, you know, it, like taking the feeling and putting the feeling on paper, basically. So is there a feeling of, well, I've already kind of done it in the journal I don't, or diary. I don't need to no, that's, do it no, for real. No, no, because it's because that's a different because because the diary is, I, you know, there's different like if I write something for print, if I'm writing a comic strip or something, there's a lot of writing and rewriting and rewriting with it, you know, and there's and and uh, generally, I mean, and and uh, but the. But with with um, you know with the diary, it's just it's kind of like a, a lot of first draft, a lot of whatever. It, but it's also a lot of redundance, a lot of mm -hmm. just whatever the hell it is, you know, whatever. It's really kind of like putting my gut in the page, you know, and and which I think is I think it's a, a valuable thing to do. But it, it, you know, I wanted to write, I wanted to be a writer. And they and when I was you know I was a senior in high school and and you know they say well if you're going to be a writer write you know and I thought and I also thought if I write if I just write every day in this diary maybe things like what I wrote for that class that I didn't read the assignment maybe stuff like that would start happening but it did make me you know fluid with you know it, it, it I mean anyway it was a good good thing to do but currently I'm working on two graphic novels one's kind of a cowboy thing that's um kind of absurd cowboy thing and um because i because i grew up watching westerns and that template is just in my you know that form is in my yeah. head but and so have you, I, have you seen joe chardello's book do you, do you know joe i, have, the I know joe but okay. i haven't seen his book it, it, it's not what you're talking about i hope but um joe did a book of illustrations of spaghetti western figures Italians and Western culture, oh, you know, a cowboy Western culture, and sort of how they were transformed through his childhood. I think he's around your age, a little bit younger. Could be. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, he might be about, uh, he was born mid 50s, I think. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's this wonderful, oh, wonderful I'll book. I'll, I'll get you a copy of it because it's, oh, good. It's yeah, very no, special and it's in Joe's illustrative style. Yeah, that, he's a beautiful yeah. draftsman. He's yeah. great. And I, I, well, I, mine is a very different kind of a thing. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an absurd, somewhat surreal story that that it starts with this cowboy, the form. You know, because I just that form is so embedded in me. There's you know, westerns and baseball are pretty embedded in my system as templates. I yeah. don't know. So, Culture, and then the other culturally, one, those were the those are the yeah. That's things. what you know, and that's and, but and and uh, but the other thing is oh, but the other the other thing I'm working on is kind of like a memoir um no it's sort of well I, basically it's sort of like i kept all these diaries so this is actually about my life although it's as a novel it's you know i it's a i name the character somebody else every everything has different names and but it's 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 a it's a kind of a serious thing about um it's it's kind of like a bill dung's roman or um you know um whatever you know my sort of sort of begin, begin, it's a, it begins with a kind of a, te a trauma from my youth and then it kind of goes through my dealing with it you know mm -hmm. i don't know they were just my sort of it's a like about personal evolution or something so those two things so those are those are the things that i'm i'm i, I want to hang in with to do um 
you know, to, to, to do a novel yeah. form. Um, I, I, I mean, cause you asked me a question, which was something that I made that made that come to mind. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, who knows? Um, I think it was just whether there, you know, whether you wanted to tell those stories post McDoodle Street or whether, you know, your career took you. In tell another, which stories? Uh, well, these sorts of things, just, you know, t telling more novel size. Um, I, yeah, I know. love. Well, I really I, I'm, I'm drawn to the I'm drawn to the form of a novel. I, I'm, I you know, I, I I mean, I, I, I sometimes I think that a lot of these chapter ones that I've written, I might try to turn into short stories, you know, in, in words and image, I think, you know, but it's, but you still, a story requires what it requires, you know, like, like, you know, with the, with, with this, uh, first novel, as you know, the, the Western thing, it's like, I, I started somewhere and as I wrote, things came into it. And then each thing that comes into it, now I'm responsible for this. So then, yeah. the, so then where it <laughs> needs to go expands. So it's like, you know, so then you got to address that. So, you, you know, so it then, you, like then, a, then it kind of wants to be a longer form. Yeah. Of course, the, 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 uh, the, the challenging thing about that is that it takes time. Like the more, the more you, you have in it, the more time it takes. So then that's a, that's a practical factor. Yeah, how did, that. how's your drawing changed in terms of not just being able to do things more efficiently, but, you know, how do you look at your, you're drawing today and and see how it compares to to you know well maybe that era of mcdoodle street you know how, how's the drawing well i think I, I i i you know i'm you said I'm, the eyes aren't as good I'm but, ha you know. yeah but i but i feel like i um i'm you know this this uh sort of memoir novel i'm writing i i'm which is actually both of these novels i think i want to draw in this style there's a there's a way that I like where I, I did I did a children's book, Mini Maloney and Macaroni and in all pencil after I'd done these kind of tighter ink things, you know, mm -hmm. where you, you know, you, you do like you, you do a rough sketch and you refine, and refine. And then on the light box, you're, you know, you're refining the ink line and all that stuff. And it's but it's it, it's there's good things about that. And um, and then it's also there's a certain amount of tedium in the process, you know. Mm -hmm. The I, another thing I've done is etchings and just drawings where I just draw like because I'm making an image, you know, and I just do directly and I, and I might glue over paper and draw over that and correct and everything. And and that's when I'm making just a picture spontaneous. And I, I, the, the spontaneous part is fun when I'm doing a, an image like an etching or something or where or some drawings that I do. Um, I like to just go at it and I and I and I like to skip the tedious part for in, yeah. that, in that regard, you know, and, and so, but when I do something like a graphic novel comic strip, there's, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of a tedious part where it's like you, like you write out the thing. The writing is always the hardest part and you write out the thing and write a lot of writing, rewriting, get that all figured out. And then you got to like block it out in the, you know, in the, into panels, you know, to, and and, a, yeah. and letter, you know, and that a lot of that gets kind of tedious, you know, and and uh, but anyway, and then the drawing can get tedious, and and but but what I but what I'm doing now is I'm I you mean know, on these two books I'm doing um, this thing more with pencil, which is a, it's a little bit like if you're in a if you're doing figure drawing and you got like charcoal and a kneaded eraser and you can like you can. You can press the charcoal, make it dark. You can do it lightly. You can smear it and you can erase it. And you can, it's like, it's not very, charcoal is not very permanent, but when you're working like that, you can just go at what you want. You don't, you know, it isn't yeah. like, oh God, I made a market. I got to cover it up. I got to, I got to, I mean, it's, you know, so the way I'm working more with basically pencil, eraser, ink, and um, white paint in these two novels, for instance, for the artwork, it's much more spontaneous. So I enjoy that, you know, yeah. that, that I can, you know, it's like if I get it on, I can put something on the, on the, on the paper and then I can fix it as I do it. You know, I can like, I can, I can, you know, I can start with a number two pencil and just scribble out and then slowly figure it out. And then, and then at some point, and then I can erase and mess up, you know, 
and then uh, and then eventually you know putting stuff on the page removing things covering things i can get where i want to without having this it, it, it removes a certain amount of the tedium and i think the work i like the image better you know so it's so that's it's less overworked um, in that respect well it might be very worked whether it's yeah. overworked just depends on how it looks if it looks <laughs> if it looks crappy i guess it's yeah, overworked, that, that's overworked. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah yeah but but no it's just it's it's a more spontaneous way to do it and it's and it's um you know there's just different ways to work but i i'm enjoying this way to work where where um I can just change it as I go, fix it as I go a lot more. I mean, on on um, on um, McDoodle Street, on Who Needs Donuts, for instance, I um, I did corrections where I mean, I did these these very they you know where I would with with Who Needs Donuts, I would I I mean I you know once I got to the finish, then I draw the finish through a light box, and then if I had an area on the finish that I needed to change, where I didn't want to redraw the whole thing, I would cut out this this Strathmore paper very carefully, and I'd even bevel the edges and I'd glue it on just so and get the redraw you know redraw everything just so, and it was like that was what I did for a fix, you know, and, yeah. and there's places where there's, there's paper glued over and you don't, can't see it unless I show you, you know, right. and, but you know, you could, could go a little insane doing that. I'm, I'm actually quite good at doing those kind of fixes, well, but I, I, it reminds me of the Blackman covered that issue of humbug. Uh, uh, I don't know if I know that. I know a million Blackman. little hats. He's got all these, these <laughs> hats that are, that are in there and apparently it took him days to, and they're all cut out. And he, he put them all oh, one really? guy there, and all these, <laughs> and somebody came in and like moved one once before it went to press. And Blackman just lost his mind. Right, I, I understand that completely. <laughs> I do understand that. No, I remember we had this teacher, Paul Resica, a painter in Cooper, and he just said, you know, you see on the wall, I, you know, like like it was some painting on the wall, and it was like a little bit crooked, and he. And he, you know, he straightened it or something. He said that should bother you. I don't know, whatever. But <laughs> but uh, but basically, yeah. No, I know. And you got to try to not go insane about stuff like that. But yeah, it's composition is really key. Composition is the energy of the whole thing. And it, you know, it's. I mean, it's. You know, all this stuff underneath it all. It's about energy. You know, if I'm drawing spontaneously, which is really fun, it's always about the the energy of the feeling. The city has an energy. It has yeah. a feeling. And and then I feel it viscerally, and then I try to put it on the page. You know, I try to put it on the paper. And you know, McDoodle Street or anything. When I you know when I look at my work, it's like, does it have the energy I want or not? And you know, like the whole thing about moving the hat or then whatever, that you know that messes oh, yeah. it. And and you know, um, I I I, I um, spent a lot of time looking at art over many years as well as doing it, and. Um, and and um and just looking at the world visually you know taking taking it in and um and then i would notice you know you I'd go to the i go to museums and i'd look at you know de kooning or somebody and i would just feel and i'd look at matisse and i just feel and it would i'd feel different you know i'd breathe differently i'd you know and 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 it was like and there was this was something very real you know f for me so it's like what is this? And one one day I was I for for a bunch of years I lived near the Metropolitan Museum of Art and I had a membership. I'd go over there and treat it like my living room. Yeah. And um so I so um and I'd wander all directions there and one time I wandered off into the Chinese section and there was this woman giving one of these walking lectures, so I just started following along and it was she was talking about Chinese scholars rocks and and uh and and uh Chinese scholars in like the sixteen hundreds or the fourteen hundreds or some some time like that, and they would meditate on these these gnarly kind of rocks, and they would also meditate on these Chinese paintings that had like gnarly tree trunks and stuff and 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 you know like uh, but anyway with a kind of a this kind of turbulent you know, look to them or whatever. And, and, uh, she said they would contemplate these, they would call them scholars rocks. And they said they would receive chi from them, you know, and, and chi energy. And, and I, and when she was saying that, I thought, yeah, you know, cause this is a real thing for me. Yeah, this yeah. is chi. 
And that's what, you know, and that's what I'm putting into the page. And that's what I wanted to come out of the page. You know, that's what that's what's being transmitted. Yeah. It's chi. You know, it's not just some something that might or might not be there or I'm some insane person. It's, you know, it's not this. It can invisible. be that, too. But, but yeah, yeah. No, it could be that. It can be that. But, you know, it's like, um, well, you know, but there's a precedent. There, I had a neighbor who was a yeah. jazz musician. And, and you know, I, I, I mean, I appreciate a certain amount of jazz. And then and through the years, I go on to see some jazz greats around the village and stuff. But um, so this guy, Ray Anderson, he's a um, he's a uh, trombonist and, and he and his wife lived uh, in, my, in the same building where I was in McDougal Street. And I was good friends with them for some years. And um, and uh, Ray was this brilliant, wonderful guy. And um, and but anyway, the point is and, and he was like deep into jazz. I mean, he's deep into this stuff. And I and. Stuff that I could, I just was beyond my yeah, ability to know the, what. The yeah, I mean, it. and he'd yeah. listen to stuff and he'd hear, you know, it just, yeah. okay, so I'm kind of that way with art, you know, so that, I mean, sometimes people go into the Museum of Modern Art, but I mean, I'm like, there's a lot that I miss in a lot of music, you yeah. know, um, and there's a lot that I miss in a lot of things, you know, but there's certain art that I'm deep into, and, and there, you know, there are people who walk into the, you know, the Museum of Modern Art and say, you know, my four-year-old could do that and or whatever, you know, and it's like, well, you know, there are a lot of people that, you know, or, or they like representational art, everything, what does this mean or whatever? And, you know, I, 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 I comp to me, composition, the energy of a composition, you know, form and color, you know, th that language it means more to me than what's being represented, you know, yeah. and, and, and that's, that's a really important thing to me in my work is just that, that chi, you know, that, that, the, 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 you know, the, the energy of the, of the, of the composition of the, and so if that, you know, if, if, if Bob Blackman sees that, 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 you know, Bob Blackman, you move his hat and he, and he feels that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, uh, again, something that I, when you asked before we started recording, sort of why You're I You're going to edit this. this, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Me, <laughs> yeah. But, but when you asked before I, we started, you know, why do you do this? It's to better understand things like this, you know, to, uh -huh. to, to get to know people. It's great have, that you do it. It's great that this. you do that. And it's a passion of yours. It's great. Yeah. It you. is, isn't it? I Like I say, it zeroes out my karma. I get to learn about it's wonderful. You know, artists who yeah. actually... Well, actually, um, you mentioned Pfeiffer as, as an influence. Yeah. Are there cartoonists and, well, illustrators, non, you know, quote unquote, fine artists who you see as peers and people you keep up with? You mean as point? friends or as well? Uh, in terms of their art, in terms of their work. That I follow their work. Let's see. The, um which is a way well, of saying. Not, so, whose comics are you reading? But, um, you know. Well, I, well, I'm I'm kind of a you know I just I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot. Well, so. I can just say I'm not a I'm not a deep into it in the way I'm not a I'm not a scholar of all this stuff like no no I, I guess I'm, yeah like Art Spiegelman or Steve Heller or a lot of people that are there are people that are just you know they. They're yeah. like they just know a lot of yeah. I I, I, I was I, asked I, to judge a yeah. uh, co-judge a uh -huh. cartooning prize this year right. for for Slate uh -huh. and the Center for Cartoon <clears throat> Studies asked me on as the guest judge. Uh -huh. and I, I told them in advance. I'm like, you understand, I'm not keeping up with you know ten thousand <laughs> right. young cartoonists. I'm probably going to come back with Pfeiffer, Woodring, and and a few <laughs> other guys who are all in their sixties right. if not older. And they were fine with that. We ended up achieving oh, a good. nice long list, but. They were introducing me to work. I'm like, I would never have come across this under normal circumstances because I can't, you know, no matter what our ages are or what the, the gap is, you, you just can't keep up with everything. Yeah, uh, I, and, I'll tell you, this is, here's the thing that happened yeah. to me. See, when I was a kid, um, my parents were cartoonists. Their, their, their cartoons were in the magazines on occasion. You know, I mean, they were, they were in a lot of magazines. But yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes they'd be in Saturday Post or something and people would send people, you know. People knew my parents were artists, and I and I was I was usually the best artist in my class, and I kind of was known for my drawing mm -hmm. and all this. And some people would say your parents did it for you, or your parents helped you with it, yeah. which which gave me a phobia basically. And um, so 
So I had a certain, you know, when I was in um, Cooper Union, my friend uh, Bill uh, sh uh, showed me, he said, this, this, this record album cover, this album cover is... Um, is li like your work, and he showed me this thing, and it was Crumb's um, oh, that Big Brother and the Big Holding Brother Company. and the Holding Company, and I looked at that, and I decided I'm going to avoid looking at his work, and I avoided okay. looking at Crumb's work for yeah. about 20 years, 15 or 20 years. I mean, I, I take glances at it once in a while, but I basically I didn't want anybody to say that I copied anybody, that I took anything from any. Yeah. I know I had a real, although I definitely had influences, you know, like. Pfeiffer, George Gross, Ronald Searle, I mean, whatever. I, but 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 I, I would say that I have a certain kind of. Um, a, a, in some ways, I looked other places. Also, I went to Cooper Union, where where they um, when I was there, they kind of frowned on um, you know anything commercial, whatever. But I got into going to museums and also going to I and so. In a way, I felt like I went to look for kind of fine art influences, and, you know. But I, I mean, I and I fell in love with Picasso, Matisse, mm -hmm. uh, a long list of people, you know. And and um, and I and um, so I, you know, I I I didn't read every comic. I didn't, you know, I didn't. Uh, so I, I I now I I I look more, and there's and there's and there's certainly people I admire, but but uh, you know, I had a kind of a I kept a certain distance in a way from some other people's work um, because of that, um, that kind of phobia. I, I over, I, I mean, I, I've, 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 I think I've come a long way about that, but there was a, you know, there was a period I would never let anybody, you know, suggest an idea to me if I, or whatever. I was very, I, I, I mean, um, because it's a, there's a way that you get kind of erased, you know, if you, it's like, yeah. well, you put everything into something, and then they say, "Well, you didn't really, it, you didn't even do this." Yeah, this or, is somebody yeah, else's. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that was so that that may be one. You know, I think there are some people whose family, whose parents weren't cartoonists, whose who never had anybody say that to them, who like just dive into you yeah. know that world, uh, you know, and suck up everything in sight. Because, but and I have many influences. And I I suck up many things, but. Um, but but I I I I went a lot of different directions in what I would be taking in, and and yeah. So I so I'm uh, so I don't have a, I, you know, I have a different view of that. Is there a a path not taken for you, or a direction for you me? wish you'd stuck in, or you'd, you'd stayed I, with? I have to think about that. I I, I I'm I. Um, because it's been a very long and somewhat varied career. I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're within the same ballpark generally, but um, well, it's uh, let's see. I um, the main thing I think about is is um, by the age of thirty or forty, I needed to be financially um, in, in financially free, mm -hmm. and I wasn't. You know, so so I so I did a, a you know I did a fair amount of things for money that I that in in some respect I think was a waste of time because I think I could have done better work that if I could have done exactly what I wanted to do mm -hmm. instead you know I could I mean if if by the age of 30 or 35 I'd been financially free I think I would have done I would have a I would have I would have a better body of work now than than knocking out you know uh, these all these cartoons about the the federal deficit, and, you know, and, <laughs> and whatever, you know, and, yeah. and and various things that were just I, nothing I, wrong with you making your money this? dealing with Washington. Oh yeah, feel free. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah <laughs> I, I I I even I mean I I did a too much shit for money. Yeah. You should have had a podcast. Had to, had to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I always did things I loved along the way. I mean, I always, well, I always. Did whatever I did in the diary. And I always did my own art for myself, and I always made my efforts at writing, you know, at writing these novels and things. You know, I'd, I'd write my chapter ones and all these things. Yeah. And and at this point, I'm I'm just going at the the these books that I want to write. You know, uh, but, but oh, I'll tell you what I what I you know, if I'd gotten independently wealthy and had a big space, which I never really had the really kind of space I needed. Um, 
I would have made these. I love Alexander Calder and um, and I love um, um, uh, Judy Faff, P F A F F, and um, different. And I would have done um, this kind of a lot of uh, um, kind of wire and wire and wood and whatever kind of sculpture. Like I would. I mean, I would have done some kind of mobile thing and some kind of stand, I, you know, there's, there's things in sculpture or whatever you call it. I'm not, you know, it's, I mean, uh, it's sculpture. It's yeah. in the category of sculpture with, with wood and wire and other materials and cloth. And I think I could have done amazing things in that. I, I, I think I could have done just amazing things in that. And, and, you know, I had to do too much shit for money and that's, you know, I, I, I you know, that, that, that was, um, um, so that, that, you know, I, I, I wish that hadn't been the case. And I also like just making, I would like to just make my own fine art, my own, you know, I'd like to do some gigantic, you know, paintings, you know, like big, you know, big, yeah. like big murals and things like, you know, big, like giant figure paintings, you know, that, that cover a huge wall. Um, I think I could do some really fantastic things, but I, but I, you know, it's like, it has never been practical. So yeah, I regret that I I regret that I couldn't. And also, no, I have more regrets. And I, oh jeez, you know, I'm yeah, killing yeah. you now. I feel I re- terrible. Well, I regret that I I regret that when I was um uh that I when I was three, I wasn't taught blues guitar. Uh, <laughs> you know, I do an Elvis, so you know that. Uh, uh, you're yeah. an Elvis impersonator. <clears throat> yeah, and that a, was yeah. that was so an Elvis that, impressionist. Yeah. Whatever. Well, yeah, yeah. Lou Lou Brooks is <clears throat> this fellow. <clears throat> Excuse me, the illustrator. He said, "I'm the. I was the first Elvis impersonator. Impersonator. I don't know. <laughs> but and we had a little band back when, you know, a, bun- a bunch of us cartoonists, and I did Elvis. But no, but I I like to sing. But um, I I think I could have sung blues, but that's a separate thing. But um, I mean, that's another. Oh yeah, yeah. And then another thing. No, I and I regret. I think I could have done some comic acting. Um, I think I I think I had some ability. I loved Charles Ludlum. Do you know who that was? Yeah. I loved Charles Ludlum, Ridiculous Theater. I used to go see everything I could of his, and I one time almost took lessons with him, but I didn't. But um, yeah, I would have. I I have a I have a ham side, a theater like an, a, a performer side, and 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 I, you know I've been funny in front of audiences and so like when i do the elvis and stuff and and that's a real kick to make people laugh um and i just you know it was never practical to, there was just you know there were, i just couldn't get to those things so were your parents performers uh, uh, i mean just in terms really. of really no yeah. no well, they laughed though we laughed but we yeah. didn't know my they weren't really performers like I, when you were at, at friends parties or anything were they the, the singing really. duo no, or they anything weird? no they okay. weren't no they weren't it's just um i i i i was you know as a kid i was in some ways i was very shy and on the other hand side on the other hand i had this ham side but i was never like in the school plays or anything i mean i think i i think i could have been a, maybe a funny actor you know whatever um a character and, actor uh, yeah something yeah. like that i could have been funny on stage because i i have been funny on stage sometimes and and it's a real kick you know it's a real high i mean when my elvis thing like you know at some point i had to make some patter to go between the songs and and um and i made some funny patter yeah. you know and it was and and uh and i did a funny you know i did a funny elvis as well as a um you know, people, when I do the Elvis, people often say you look like you're, um, what's the word, you know, when you get taken over or something. I'm possessed? Yeah, something like that, yeah. you know, or, um, yeah, yeah, like I'm, you know, because uh, I, cause I think I get into the, because he, he affected me deeply, so I get into a, 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 a kind of an emotional place with it. And um, so, anyway, I think I had, I think I had, um, I've had performing abilities that I did not, um, make use of fully. Uh, I understand. It's okay. <laughs> Did, do you ever see your your influence on other artists? Well, people or has, say. Or has they, anyone come yeah, back to you with? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I should. I got people. Several. I won't say who they are, but several well known illustrators have told me McDoodle Street was a big influence on them. Um, oh, well, uh, a few 
episodes ago, James Sturm, uh, the the guy who yeah James the Center like, for God Cartoon bless Studies. James. I, I think as it was he the guy who turned on New York Review Comics to McDoodle Street, or is it I, just I believe he was. That's what I've heard. You know, okay. I I, I used to get... yeah, he, he talked about that being the thing that like got him from superheroes into the bigger world of, of cartoons. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. And it's really great, and he's an extremely talented guy. So I'm really proud that I was that influence. Well, in nineteen uh, in the in the let's see the nineteen eighties and early nineties maybe I used to um, Steve Heller who uh, you know, Steve I've Heller you know, with, yeah, brilliant yeah, yeah. brilliant designer the most prolific writer on how this, he does that every he's day I'll never understand he's an unbelievable oh. he's really got he's a just he's the got Daily about Heller twelve is brains Daily. no he's yeah. just he's just well not just Heller I mean he writes all these books and he's does he's oh. just he's yeah. unbelievable anyway. Steve Heller, who I've known since, you know, the early 70s, Steve Heller um, 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 was teaching, he may still teach uh, this graduate class at School of Visual Arts in, for, in, you know, like um, for a master's and it's about like sort of, I think it's like journalistic something or other. And he would, for a bunch of years, he had me be like the last speaker of the semester for his classes and and I'd show my work and all this stuff. And um, and James Sturm was in one of those classes. And at the end of the class, he came up to me, he told me he was this huge fan of McDoodle Street and how it was so important to him. And he, and he actually asked me if he could be my, um, you know, intern or something, you know, be my assistant. Yeah. I, 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 um, I, I, I really couldn't figure out how to how to do that. But anyway, I didn't, I, I, I really, I wasn't able to accommodate that, yeah. but, but, um, God bless James Sturm. I mean, he, you know, he, um, his, uh, appreciation of McDoodle street is, is, is probably a big reason why it got back in print, but he wrote this wonderful thing about it online mm -hmm. about McDoodle street. And, um, and, you know, he's a, you know, I mean, McDoodle street, you know, when I was doing it, I, I, I was, and when I finished it, I was very happy that I did it, and I got it in print, and it was, and it got some really nice reviews and everything, but it kind of got lost, you know. So it was very nice to have somebody like James. I mean, there were others, but I mean, James was in the forefront of of, of wanting it to, yeah, sort of you know, reclaiming come, it. Yeah, print. and yeah. you know, I mean, it's people like that, that. That's why, you know, I mean, I owe a, 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 a lot of gratitude to James for. Um, for uh, helping this book to get reprinted, you know, just just for for um, you know, anyway. So that's that's so that's James. Is it the uh, is it the work you're proudest of? Uh, well, so far, uh, knowing what? that you have, no, so far knowing that you have these other two books you're working on. So. Um, yeah, we had this teacher at Cooper Union, Robert Guathme. He always said your your best painting is always your next painting. Sure. Um, I would say that there's. Um, I would say that it's it's a part of it's a part of the work that I feel best about. I mean, who needs donuts? I feel, you know, um, the posters I did for the for the Times Square in the Village, and then um, and I like my etchings. Some, you know, but I I'd say that it, I'd say that McDoodle Street is is um, well, like I said, it's the closest I ever got to what I really wanted to do in books i you know and i'm and um so i would say it's it's very dear to my heart and it's and and it, it's definitely if if uh, if i'm saying what are my favorite things i've done it's right in there in the center of it um but i but i but i'd say there's there's when you ask me a question like that i i I feel like I go into the core of my life's passion and um, that's what I love the most. Yeah. And this is an expression of it. And, um, and this is one of the better, um, one of the better expressions of it. And at that time it was the best, it was, you know, it was, it was the best I could do. I think it's a great piece of work. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, sure. It was a lot of fun.
And that was Mark Allen Stamity. His new book is MacDoodle Street from New York Review Comics, which collects his comic strip from the 70s and adds a new coda to it. It's a fantastic piece of work, which I hope I conveyed in the uh, the intro and our conversation. And I think Mark's selling himself short about how well it captures that late 70s era in the village. You should definitely pick it up. And if you get a chance, see Mark at next week's MOCA Festival in New York City. Again, that's April 6th and 7th, uh, 2019, for you time travelers out there. And like I mentioned at the top, a ton of, of past pod guests will also be at MOCA. So hit societyillustrators.org to learn more about the MOCA Arts Festival. Now, Mark's website is Mark Allen Stamity, which is going to be tough to spell. I'm going to give it to you now. M-A-R-K-A-L-A-N-S-T-A-M-A-T-Y dot com. Near as I could tell, Mark is not on Twitter or Instagram, probably on Facebook, but who knows? Uh, look up Washing Tunes. You'll also, if you look that up, you'll find the, the spelling there. And Tunes is T-O-O-N-S. You'll find Mark's name connected to that. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Mark, so, who you been reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that, man, get some extra conversation. You'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The first quarter of 2019 episode should be up soon if I've got time next weekend. Uh, the fourth quarter of 2018 episode features book recommendations and some extra conversation with Eddie Campbell, Nora Krug, Jason Lutz, Summer Pierre, David Small, Mark Derry, Michael Gerber, Angela Himsel, Kathy B. Graham, Shahar Pinsker, and Bill Cardalopoulos. You can support the Virtual Memories Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, which I think Mark's browbeating will help me get back to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at my hotel room in New York City, where I was staying for a four-day business conference. So that means there are literally no podcast-related expenses on this one, since work was paying for my travel, hotel, meals, etc. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Otaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Stephan, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Now, our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. Check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with David Shields, author of the new book, The Trouble with Men, Reflections on Sex, Love, Marriage, Porn, and Power. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMS Pod, at Virtual Memories Podcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, tell people on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, 
and keep the conversation going.